Earlier this week, while driving around central Delaware, my Sirius satellite radio was set to a particular station, one of three that I tend to listen to pretty frequently. This one happened to be one called Classic Vinyl, or it might have been Deep Tracks, I don't remember which. But anyhow, a, a song came over the speakers that I, I've been thinking about all week long. The, the song might be one you recognize, not necessarily because of the original group who recorded it, but because it was the title soundtrack of a very popular television program. That television program was called CSI. Anybody remember CSI, Grissom and the crew? <laughs> the title of the song was sung originally by a group called The Who, and it might be their anthem, if you will. The, the words to the song go something like this. Who are you? Who, who, who are you? I'd really like to know. I had to look up the words. I mean, I knew it because, I mean, it plays ad infinitum on CSI, but I had to go back to it because, you see, as I meditated and prayed over this scripture this week, I, I've been, it's been reinforced to me, if you will, how fundamental the question of identity is to us as people. It is a basic question that we will all ask literally almost all the time. Well, now, we might not necessarily realize we're asking the question. But, you know, you would, I wouldn't suspect I'd, I'd come along you and find you under a broom tree somewhere, maybe with a hot cup of tea and your legs crossed, asking the question, well, who am I anyhow? And, you know, I don't have to have my wallet with me this morning. There are some mornings I get up and uh, I should probably take my wallet out and look at, and make sure the picture on my driver's license matches the one in the mirror. Do you ever have mornings like that? You know, it just doesn't quite all hit on all eight. But no, identity is, is one of those issues out of which we operate and really don't even consider. When you stop and think about it, your self-awareness, your self-understanding of who you are affects how you dress every day. Right? Okay. Uh, and let me just kind of illustrate really quickly for you. I, 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 I know something about Joe's understanding of his identity this morning. Joe's wearing a Donovan McNabb jersey. Jersey. It seems to me that Joe is probably an Eagles fan. It's not purple and black, not gold and crimson, or whatever the Redskins are. There's an awareness there. If, if you came in and you were wearing camouflage, you, you may have an identity as a hunter, or in a business suit, you may be a business-minded person. The question of identity affects how we dress. It affects the food we eat. My good friend Bud Reedy last week was preparing, and, and Bud's a jokester, but he was preparing for a uh, dinner they were having. And you, have you heard of a turducken? It, it's yeah. a turkey with a duck stuffed inside and a chicken stuffed. Turducken was too good for Bud. He posted a picture. I don't even know what to call it. I almost started to call it something. I better not say it like that. It was a turkey with an octopus stuffed inside. And there's some of you that the minute I say octopus, uh, I wouldn't be eating any octopus. Why? Parts of the world, it's a delicacy. By the way, it's very good. But why? Can I pick on you for a minute, Dave? Dave's a steak and taters man. We've had that conversation over and over again. Your identity affects what you eat, what you believe you can eat. For instance, if we were all raised in South Africa, we wouldn't think twice about having chocolate-covered ants. Here in America, if you have chocolate-covered ants, they're going in the tr trash because they invaded your house somewhere. somewhere. Identity determines what you eat. It determines our values, the trajectory of our life, our careers. By the way, thinking of that, there's a young lady from our congregation you should be praying for for the next 13 weeks. 
On Monday morning, Felicity Annis shipped off to Paris Island to spend her next 13 weeks in basic training to become a Marine. For the last two years, Felicity's identity is that of a Marine. By the way, she passed her initial fitness test with flying colors. Pray for her. Pray for Dale and Sharon. They're struggling with first kid out of the nest and all of that. Self-awareness determines so much. Our upbringing helps determine it. Our, the values that our parents instill into us. Our education. The culture that we live in. All determines how we understand who we are at the core of our being. Our faith determines our self-awareness and our identity. The books that we read, the programs that we watch, the friends that we have, all for, and the conversations that we have, all serve to form and mold our identity, that central awareness of who we are. Now, here's what you need to know about that, though. There are times in life when our experiences don't necessarily match with our understanding of who we are. There are times when things happen, the crisis that we face, the events of our life do not match with the identity of who we are, and that can shake the foundation of our being. In philosophical terms, we have what's called an existential crisis. For instance, when you're understanding, when you're, and we men, by the way, are terrible at it. And let me illustrate how identity works out for us guys. You get a bunch of guys together that are meeting new guys. We have the same ritual that happens all the time. We go up to one another. We stick out our hand. We say, hey, I'm, who are you, is the first question we ask. What's the second one? What do you do? Who are you and what do you do? That's your identity, your name and your career, your job. But you see, there are times in life we've seen in this economy when careers can be threatened. And all of a sudden, the job that we've invested our life in dries up, we're laid off. That creates an existential crisis. Maybe I'm not who or what I thought I was after all. And we become disoriented. There's angst that goes with that. I'm not a provider. I'm not. I'm not. Because our identity has been wrapped up in our work. That person is off kilter. Another time I see existential crises is uh, those people who are so wrapped up in parenting and, and being a mom or a dad and the kids go off to school. And a funny thing happens when kids go off to school. They don't come home anymore. We're about to experience that in our household next Saturday night. You know, we're officially the empty nesters. And when your identity is wrapped up in your children, when the children are moved from the equation, all of a sudden you have this question. Who am I anyhow? By the way, probably the second highest case is when I'm seeing couples for marriage counseling or when the kids leave. Interestingly enough, we get these existential crises when we're, the things that define who we are are no longer there. Why am I going to all that trouble to talk to you about identity? Because in Matthew chapter 11, John is having an existential crisis. Make no mistake, that is precisely what's going on in the life of John the Baptist. And let me set the table for you. John the Baptist is in Herod's jail. Okay? Now please understand something about jail in the times of the New Testament relative to times today. Okay? Jail in the Old Testament, one, was certainly not as nice as jails are today. And by the way, if you've been in any of our prisons lately, nice and prisons don't go together. Somewhere there's this idea out there that prisons are nice places to be. They are not. And if you think they are, you need to make a visit. They're not nice places. But in the days of the Roman government, they were even less nice. They were probably holes in the ground with a grate over the top and a large centurion stationed. And, and when meal time came, well, let me just say it this way. Has anybody ever slopped hogs before? 
That's fine dining compared to what the Romans did. Okay? And, and when you went into a Roman prison, there were only three eventual outcomes. You could be exonerated. Didn't happen very often at all. Because what you needed to know about the Roman government, the Romans were right all the time in every way. So you could theoretically be exonerated. You could be exiled. Or you could be executed. Th that was the three outcomes when you went to a Roman jail. Exoneration, not likely. Exile, execution. John is there, likely facing his execution. Now understand, John has lived his life in the Transjordan as a prophet of God. The first prophet in the children of Israel's memory for 400 years. He's embraced this identity, called by God to prepare the way of the Lord. To say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is coming. And he's embraced that identity, his clothes, his diet, his following, all centered around that message that Messiah is on the way. And by the way, John attracted a huge following. John came and preached. People came to him from far and near to hear the word of the Lord, which had not been heard in their midst for over four centuries. Paul came preaching a message of repentance. The people wanted to hear the message and hear the voice of the roughly clothed prophet. And many were baptized in the Jordan River as a symbol of repentance. And with the crowds came John's renown. People knew who he was. They heard of him. They heard his voice. And they gathered to him. With this fame, because by the way, when you begin to get fame, you can't control fame any longer. With the fame came notice, and one of the people that took notice of him was a guy named Herod, who was the puppet king over Palestine, the Roman puppet, as it were. And John, if he was anything, he was a prophet. He was not afraid to speak the word of God, and that's exactly what he did in his camel hair and leather belt. A honey encrusted beard. He looked at Herod and his wildly dysfunctional family. Just read the book, you bear this out. And his wildly dysfunctional family, and he proclaimed the word of the Lord with boldness. And there was no repentance in Herod's palace. John the Baptist found himself in a Roman prison in Palestine because he had been faithful to proclaim the word of the Lord. Ultimately, John's career as a prophet was about to cost him his earthly life. It's in the bowels of this prison, perhaps standing under the grate when feed time comes. It's there that John has this existential crisis. And can you blame him? Can you blame him? We have existential crises for far less. I talked with somebody this week, had coffee with them, and he talked about uh, living for a time uh, working in a children's hospital. And he said, I need to tell you, the question why occurred to me a lot there. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do children suffer? Why? Why? Existential crisis. We have existential crisis when we walk out in the morning and find that it's raining or snowing. Why is it raining this morning? Why is it cold? Why did I leave my coat at work? Why isn't there milk for my cereal? You laugh, but you get my point. John is in the middle of it. And he's asking, why at the most basic level? Why am I here? My calling was to prepare the way of the Lord. Yet here I am, eating this fine Roman cuisine in a fine Roman prison, probably going to finally lose my head. Why am I here? I think at the core of his being, John is in that prison wondering if his life was worth it. I mean, really, camel hair, wild honey, 
living out in the desert and now living in a Roman prison? He's wondering if he's made the right choices with life. Has he given his life for the right things? All the choices of John's life were focused on the person and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Yet here he is in a Roman prison. John's existential crisis boils down to questions of the identity of Jesus. So John does the only thing that John can do. He sends his disciples, those who have followed him all of these years, go find Jesus and ask this question. Can I translate the question for you in my own words? Who are you anyhow? Who are you anyhow? Are you the one who is to come? Are you the one who was promised? Or is there somebody else? You see, John has an understanding. And by the way, can you hear the doubt dripping from John's question to Jesus? Are you the one that God promised? Or is there a number? Another, not a number. That is the question of a doubter. Can I just leave the script for a minute? Aren't you glad that God welcomes doubters? <laughs> Aren't you glad that God inhabits the space where we're not sure who he is? Where we're not necessarily sure what God's up to? God's okay with that. Jesus is okay with that. John is filled with doubt. And trust me, if you were in a Roman prison, I suspect you'd be free, filled with doubt as well. John's facing not only the hardship of prison, but the uncertainty of Ro Roman justice and potentially the end of his life. A life given to prepare the way for the Messiah. And here is Jesus. So at the end of his earthly life, John questions if he spent his life in vain. So he asks Jesus, who are you anyhow? It's a question of identity. John understands what few others in his day did. That that is his identity, the identity of John the Baptist, is intricately intertwined with the identity of Jesus Christ, his cousin. He had come to prepare the way of the Lord for the Messiah. His understanding was that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, here's the problem. John, at the cost of his life, is wondering if his life has been misspent. Because John understood what a Messiah should be, how a Messiah should talk, how a Messiah should act, what a Messiah should do. Problem. Jesus wasn't walking like that, talking like that, or acting like that. Isn't it interesting? that even the one who came to prepare the way of the Lord, to prepare for the coming of the kingdom of God, is faced with this crisis, a crisis so great, he's looking at the life of Jesus and saying, I'm not sure. Understand who we're dealing with here. This is not a comic. This is, if there was such a thing, a spiritual rock star. Okay. Let, let me remind you who John the Baptist was. Do you remember at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, that Jesus comes with all of the people who are flocking to the Jordan to hear John preach. And Jesus goes down to John and says, John, I want you to baptize me because we have a Savior who identifies with us. And John says this, oh, hold the phone, Jesus. I can't baptize you. I'm not worthy to baptize you. I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes. How low does someone have to be to not be worthy to untie your shoes? How unworthy does... Who is it that you would look at and say, Oh no, you can't even untie my shoes. If you say that to anybody, we have some other spiritual problems we have to talk about. John says, Jesus, I'm not worthy to untie your shoes. You should be baptizing me. 
You are the one who is to come. John has been for these years announcing the coming of the kingdom of God. He has been pointing his finger at the powers that be and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is coming. This is someone who was centered to what God was doing. Yet here in this moment we find John filled with doubt. Do you think it's okay to wonder? Do you think it's okay to doubt? By the way, it occurs to me as I was preparing this sermon, Jesus was fine with it. How many times in the gospel narrative do you find Jesus asking this question? Who do people say that I am? I remember an instance as Jesus was with his disciples answering the question, who are you? Jesus looked at his disciples and said, hey guys, who, who do you say that I am? Peter had the right idea, but even Peter didn't understand what Peter was saying. John is a spiritual rock star, yet because Jesus isn't doing the Messiah things, he's wondering, maybe I've missed the boat somewhere. After all, Jesus isn't running the Romans out of Israel. Jesus isn't riding on a white horse. This son of a carpenter with calloused hands and, and rough robes certainly doesn't look like any king I've ever seen. Kings don't have calloused hands, after all. Is this who I am giving my life for? Jesus isn't doing Messiah things. He's not saying Messiah-ish Messiah things. So John wonders. Out loud, if Jesus is who John thought Jesus was. And you see, if there's a common thread to the ministry of Jesus, it's this. It's mistaken identity. It's mistaken identity. People had mental models of what the Messiah would say of what the Messiah would do, of where the Messiah would come from, of how the Messiah would act. All of that centered around the remaking of Israel, throwing off the yoke of foreign slavery, and reestablishing the Davidic kingdom. He'd ride into town on a white charger with a legion of soldiers clad in the array of the righteousness of Yahweh, and the Romans would melt before them as they did in days of old, and the kingdom of Israel would be recreated again. Yet the one that John announced came from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Do you remember that? Can anything good come from Nazareth? He was a carpenter. He wasn't royal. And he didn't say anything about the royal. In fact, he said crazy things like, give to Caesar what's Caesar's. And if a Roman soldier compels you to carry his garment, go to, not one. Give him your cloak as well as your coat. That is not the words of a rebellion. People understood what Messiah would be, and Jesus said none of those things. Jesus was not uncomfortable with mistaken identity. He was not uncomfortable with the question, who are you? Who? Who? Tell me, I want to know. Jesus knew what people were saying. He asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Do you remember what their answers were? Moses, Isaiah, a prophet, a teacher, anything but a Messiah. Anything but a Messiah. None of them said Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, Who do you say that I am? There was an uncomfortable silence. Have you ever had somebody ask you a question that you kind of knew the answer to, but you were afraid to tell the answer? Waiting for somebody else. And Pete, it had to be Peter. Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's said, Peter, you're right. Jesus was very comfortable with mistaken identity. And his answer to John's understanding of who he was, listen again to what John is told through Jesus. Jesus answered them, his disciples, 
and said, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. What is missing from that report back to John? First off, nowhere in that report back to John does Jesus say, John, yes, I'm the Messiah. Wouldn't that have been the easiest way to go? John, it's simple. I'm the Messiah. Interestingly, for three years, Jesus rarely makes that statement in that bold fashion. Because people need to come to discover that on their own. John, by the way, is right there. The one who came to announce the way of the Lord now needs to transition to become a disciple of the Lord. Nowhere does Jesus say, John, I am the Messiah. What else is missing? Notice, there is not one place where anybody that can remotely smack of affluence is mentioned. Jesus' whole answer concerns poor, widowed, justice, broken, ill, in bondage. Does that surprise you? When Jesus, speaking of his own identity, says to John, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news to them. By the way, shouldn't our identity reflect that identity as well? I'll come more to that in a minute. Jesus has a very clear understanding of his identity, of his mission, of his purpose. Jesus understands that he has, in fact, come to bring the kingdom of God right here, right now. The kingdom is defined first and foremost by God's concern for those who are least able to care for themselves. If Scripture bears anything out, that's what it bears out. The Levitical law. Have you read Leviticus or Deuteronomy lately? <laughs> it goes on and on and on about ways for the kingdom people of God to protect those who cannot protect themselves, to care for those who cannot <coughs> care for themselves, to keep the rich and the powerful from abusing the poor. Interestingly enough, never in history, never in history has God's covenant law been lived out. Never been lived out fully. It will be one day. The kingdom is got defined by God's concern for those least able to care for themselves. The kingdom that comes is one of healing. And I mean a genuine healing, not an opioid-induced euphoria that we come to associate with healing. It's a true healing where those who have been sick and broken are made new. The kingdom of God comes and it's one where the poor receive justice and God's shalom comes for all. Not just those who are affluent enough to afford it. Remember, this passage in Scripture, Jesus, as he's beginning his earthly ministry in Luke's Gospel, we find Jesus in the synagogue. And the, the Pharisees and Sadducees recognize something in Jesus, even though he was unlearned, even though he was not a formal scholar as they were, there was something in Jesus that caused them to say to him, Jesus, why don't you read the Old Testament reading from the prophets today? So Jesus stands up, he opens the scroll, and by the way, that was no small task. We see scrolls, we think little tiny tablets, you know, you just... those Old Testament scrolls were monstrous, and it was one continuous page. There was no easy way to get anywhere in the Old Testament. You didn't just flip pages, you unrolled that bad boy. So Jesus takes this big scroll and unrolls it to the middle, a passage in Isaiah, and he reads these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news 
to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind to set liberty those who are impressed, oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Sounds a lot like his response back to John, doesn't it? Oh, and then by the way, Jesus, and by the way, this is a messianic prophecy in Isaiah. This is what the people of Israel were looking for. They were looking for the Messiah who would bring this to pass. Jesus rolls it up, folds his arms, looks at the scribes and Sadducees and said, Today, in your hearing, this scripture has been fulfilled. And they had a great worship service. Oh, they sang psalms, they ran the aisles, they praised the Lord. Messiah had come. Nobody's going to disagree with me. Any scholars out there say, no, Pastor, that's not the way that happened. It's not the way it happened. He read it. They were furious with him. They took him outside his town. They were going to throw him down an embankment and stone him to death. Because in their mind, he was blasphemy. This is the identity of the Messiah. <coughs> Jesus had a profound understanding of what his identity was in the scheme of God's redemption. His life from birth to ascension reflected that purpose lived that identity. John's identity from preparer for the kingdom must now be transformed by the one who had come to bring the kingdom to pass. John needed to come transformed from announcer to disciple. He must make the transformation from preparer to follower. In other words, his identity must be defined more completely by his faith in the one he announced. I need to look this image up. An article that I was reading this week preparing for this talked about an Eastern Orthodox church in Russia. Uh, in, in their icon uh, gallery, they have, uh, right at the very front of the church, they have three icons. Of course, the highest and central icon is the risen and glorified Christ. After all, that's who we worship, right? After all, that's who we worship, right? Who had me worried there for a minute. Uh, on the left side is the icon of the Holy Mother, Mary, who is looking at her son, beholding her son. And interestingly, on the right side of Jesus is John the Baptist, who is also looking at Jesus and pointing towards him. You see, this passage is marking a transformation in identity. John's been saying, he must increase and I must decrease. John is coming to understand that there is an identity shift when we become followers of Jesus Christ. His mission and purpose must define who we are. The circumstances of John's life caused him to question, to wonder. The mission of the Messiah being realized must be the transformative experience as John makes his transition. I ran across this quote that was too good for me to let go as I was reading this week. I want to share it with you. The question of what constitutes true discipleship has haunted Christians ever since Jesus began to call people to follow him. Their model has sometimes been a holy man or a woman who abandoned civilization to practice the solitary ascetic disciplines in the wilderness. At other times, the Christian king, czar, or ruler has been regarded as the true disciple, as though worldly powers and riches brings a person closer to God. Can I insert my own thought there? I'm really concerned in this day and age that we've come to equate America with that. Uh, America is our God. Yet another candidate for exemplary discipleship has been the prophet. The person who declares God's will, preaches God's word, and warns the world of God's coming day of judgment. Even ministers sometimes succumb to the temptation of believing that they have moved closer to the front of the line in the kingdom of heaven because they proclaim the prophetic words in service of God and the church. These answers fall short. 
just like each of the crowd's speculation about John. True discipleship is never first a question of our efforts to make Christ known to ourselves or to others. The focus never falls first on our achievements, our worldly ambitions, or prophetic diatribes. A true disciple knows how easily we substitute the vain imaginations of our hearts in the place of the living Christ. A true disciple knows that he or she is still learning how to follow Jesus. As we are preparing our hearts this Advent season, as we are looking towards that day when Jesus Christ comes again, part of our identity following repentance that I shared with you last week is the transformation of our identity into the identity of Jesus Christ. We are followers of Jesus Christ. That identity must form our mission, our understanding of who we are, our focus. Otherwise, we are not a true disciple. A question we should ask ourselves in our Advent preparations are, Who are you? And ask those questions with honesty. Because sometimes the answer is far murkier, if you will, than we think it is. How many would say, who are you? I'm a father. I'm a mother. I'm a Delawarean. I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I'm an American. Before we say, who are you? I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Who are you? Who, who does your life follow? Who do you emulate? What does the mission of your life reflect about who you are? Advent is about reorientation. It's about refocus. It's about renewal. The identity of Jesus Christ must form our own identity, our own mission, our own focus. For we are not a true follower of Jesus Christ. I wonder, I wonder what your life says about your identity in Christ this morning. By the way, on the back of your worship folders under the sermon notes, I've shared some questions for you to pray about and consider in the weeks ahead. Questions concerning identity and how to prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ because the day certainly is coming when we will see him face to face. And the questions that will be asked of us will not be which political persuasion were you? And the questions that will be asked will not be how much was your 501c3? How much was your 401k? How much taxes did you pay? The question will be asked will be how did your reflect, life reflect the mission and message of Jesus Christ? What did you do for the least of these? Advent's preparations are all about preparing now to live in Christ's eternal kingdom. The 70 or 80 years, by the way, we have on this life are all practice. The life we live right here, right now, is practice. This isn't the game yet. This isn't the game. We are to be living our lives now, preparing to live life in the eternal kingdom of God. Why do we sing songs in worship? My friend Christy said we sing them for him. And that is the correct answer. We sing because we're preparing now to celebrate worship in the eternal kingdom of God. Where if I understand right, we're going to be singing for like 100,000 years or something. But why do we gather here in this place to worship each week? I know, you have to or you feel bad about life. No. 
we gather in this place to practice what it's going to be like when we worship around the throne. That's, this is practice. We're getting ready now for life in the kingdom to come. Why do we serve one another? For the same reason. We were created to live in vertical and horizontal relationship with God and with one another. Advent preparation is all about preparing now to live in Christ's eternal kingdom. Advent is about evaluating and ridding ourselves of the earthly influences that affect our understanding. It is so easy to allow the world to force us into its mold and what our identity should be. Advent is the time as followers of Jesus Christ where we push back against that. See, no, I'm a follower first. I'm about the kingdom of God. Advent is about shedding the culture of this world or shedding our secular Americanism and embracing the values of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. That is our identity. And oh, by the way, guess where we find our identity as sons and daughters of God? in the bread and in the cup. That's why we celebrate communion. Our identity is found there. Our identity is all wrapped up in the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. We eat and drink, like John, in faith, trusting that he is the one come to make all things new. He is the one in whom we can place our trust. He is the one who can reorder and refocus our life. So we come to the table. I would say we run to the table. Asking God to perform his renewing, healing, and transforming work in us.